hospital, choosing a supportive doctor and hospital makes a huge difference in the type of birth you will have. Learning about evidence-based options about birth and breastfeeding, how you can be supported emotionally, physically, spiritually, and also during managing your labor and postpartum are very important for those of you planning to conceive and those who have given birth. It is never too late to learn. Allah has willed you to get married. Your husband is your amana from Allah and you are an amana to him from Allah. Both of you complete half the deen for each other. Al-Hakim narrated in Mustadrak from Anas in a Marfu'a report, whomever Allah blesses with a righteous wife, he has helped him with half of his religion. So let him fear Allah with regard to the other half. Al-Bayhaqi narrated in Shu'ab al-Iman from al-Raqshi, when a person gets married, he has completed half of his religion. So let him fear Allah with regard to the other half. Albani said, of these two hadith in Sahih al targhib wal tahib they are Hassan Ligairi. So you both want a child who is righteous and the coolness of your eyes, a child who will be the sadaqa jari for you and him, a child who will please Allah in this world for the hereafter, and that you will die with peace in your heart when you look at your child at your deathbed. Don't you want that? Don't we have these visions of what all have I said above of how many of you have thought about these before? and after you have got married. At least a thought would have crossed your mind, right? So where does this begin? This all begins from the womb. Tarbiya begins from the womb. We plan our wedding, our graduation, our trips. We plan our pregnancy, but do we really plan the right way? Do we look at the know-hows, the information that we need to be equipped with while we are heading towards conception, pregnancy, childbirth, postpartum, we all know about postpartum depression, right? So how many of you have been through this? I have been through this myself. After the birth of my first child, Alhamdulillah, after I learned and got essential knowledge about childbirth, lactation and infant care, in my second pregnancy, the birth was a dream. Till this day, when I think about my second birth experience, I smile. And when I think about my first birth experience, I'm just quiet because I know how different, how big difference it had made when I had the knowledge and I birthed my second child. And when I didn't have the knowledge, even though I had a little bit, but I wasn't into completely knowing about it and how I felt after the birth of my first child. So when I learned about how important it is for a mother to know beforehand, how to mother herself. We have mothers who did take care of us, the culture and the customs, but sadly nowadays they are just as a routine and we are asked to follow blindly to what they say or even blindly to what doctors tell us without any scientific evidence, without asking any questions and without even researching or knowing about the information, the risks and the benefits behind it. This does not mean that we don't go to the doctor. We do of course when we are in a complication and that is when we know when is a complication and what exactly I'm trying to tell you. So we do know what, we do know that when we are in a complication, when do we know that? We should have the right information about our body. It is who, it is we who birth our baby instinctively and we are aware of how our body works during labor. So when we know the normalcy of pregnancy and childbirth, what to expect during the three trimesters, during the nutrition, exercise, knowing the risks and benefits of various interventions, medications, we are more informed and we tend to make the closest right choice in determining the approach we need to do it during the course of our motherhood journey. Learning about childbirth education and breastfeeding is essential for every new mother, mom-to-be and every married woman. So this therapy of our baby who is initially a fetus and embryo starts right here where we start seeking the necessary knowledge, then follows it with caring for ourselves and our baby internally, as well as externally. So during pregnancy, after conception is where our second time of tarbiya happens, taking care of the pregnancy during the first trimester. We know the know-how, we know what is going to happen, what are we going to expect. Some of us have 
the first three months nausea vomiting so we know how we need to manage that we need to be prepared of the situation if it overcomes how we need to take care of our diet because the pregnant <clears throat> the diet during the first three months is very crucial for determining the health of the baby and especially the determining the timing of the birth of the child many mothers who have not had proper nutrition during pregnancy have had premature labors or they have had low birth weight babies or they have gone through high blood pressure gestational diabetes so the first three months even though you have nausea vomiting or you don't have those symptoms at least some form of balanced nutrition is very vital for the developing fetus the first three months are very very crucial and even the first three months the stress levels your lifestyle your the way you take your pregnancy the information that you take and how you deal with the day-to-day -day life during the first three months even along with the symptoms that you have plays a very vital role in determining the type of birth you will have and as many mothers i have seen and i have supported mothers who have had who have taken care in the first three months very well and they have had good symptoms you can say they have taken care of the nutrition and their stress levels have been able to have better births than those who have not during the first three months the second trimester is yet again a, a trimester you can say a rest period during the pregnancy where the mother is able to relax and eat more type of foods she's able to relax she's able to move she's able to even have her hormones that are coming into stability so the first three months the hormones are very up and down so she needs a lot of care during the first three months the second three months she can take some rest and that is a time where she can plan out how she can have her birth and what kind of care provider she needs to look out for so this is the period she can utilize for knowing who is a care provider she needs to choose what is the kind of care she needs to take during the third trimester and especially what kind of things that she can expect that will happen in towards the labor towards her postpartum and towards her breastfeeding journey with her baby so this is could be a learning period where she could incorporate that in the second period of her second trimester of her pregnancy now the third trimester is preparation she needs to prepare for her birth she needs to prepare for her labor she needs to prepare with the information that she has and you can say revise everything and this does not happen for every pregnancy if at once she knows of the basics of the pregnancy the basics of labor birth postpartum she will be able to very well handle herself in a second pregnancy although pregnancies are very different from each other and every baby is different from each other she will have more and more confidence for each and every pregnancy that she goes through so this will help her become more empowered and more focused on her making an informed choice and discussing the same thing with her doctor with her spouse with her family and also dealing with her postpartum period which is a very crucial and vulnerable period vulnerable period for the mother that can any that any small thing can trigger her into a postpartum depression because of the hormones because of what she's going through she's in a very vulnerable state from all the three aspects of mind body and soul so she needs utmost care during that time because you, when you say that along with the baby the mother becomes a baby so it should be that there should be a support system for her to her spouse family friends community to mother the mother mothering the mother is what we say during that period of time so this third trimester goes into preparing herself communicating with her spouse her family and helping them also knowing what to expect and what she expects from them during that time of her period of pregnancy labor and birth <clears throat> now during her labor and birth this this is you can say uh, the labor birth and postpartum i would put it under the fourth trimester you can say it's not officially the fourth trimester but yes the postpartum is like a fourth trimester for her where she needs to take care of herself in a very very uh, strict manner you can say because the first month after delivery after birthing her child is very vital for her care so that she recovers properly and she's able to take care of herself and her baby properly now when she studies about the labor the labor is very different for every mother the birth is different for every mother there are short labors long labors there are intense labors there are there are easy labors also easy labors in the sense it could be just over within a few hours itself out the mother might not be going through a lot of pain 
during that time. So every every labor, every birth is different. So she needs to know, she needs to know what to expect, what is happening during the labor, the breathing exercises during labor, how to induce labor naturally, where if the mother doesn't know about these facts and she is in her third trimester expecting a baby in about one or two weeks time, usually the protocol or the routine is that, <clears throat> sorry, the doctor would be advising her to undergo a planned induction or undergo a planned cesarean and she would be not knowing why she would be going through that just because if there is, if the doctor says that, okay, the baby is too big, for birthing, uh, maybe the baby is having low birth weight, just maybe one point out of which the doctor might say this decision needs to be taken for. But she, when she is informed, she would be able to ask the doctor why, when, what, when, where, how, what are the benefits of inducing me early? What are the risks of inducing me early? What is going to be used in the induction? What is it usually during induction? It's an augmentation also or induction with a, with a medicine that they give you during that time. And or it's also during the labor period, they give you pitocin, which is like we can say uh, in uh, pitocin comes in, in, the, in the family of narcotics, basically. So for pain reduction medication, so many mothers don't know about this factor and they need to weigh their responses to the doctor when they know about this information, they'll be able to take an informed choice. And there is no hospital that would force you into this. You have the right to sign a consent form if you feel that you need to refuse it if there is no medical evidence it's not just that if, even if you are not informed about it and you want to refuse you won't be having the right information as to why you're refusing it so if you have the right information with you and talk to the doctor even during the time of your labor when your husband is also with you in studying about these factors he will be able to better take the information down and help you decide and both of you are able to decide at the time of labor or birth as to what measures have to be taken so that you can have a more happy birth experience and a more na closely natural birth experience. So we cannot say that without information, you are going to talk to your doctor about refusing things. You will need to know about the scientific aspects of these things, and it's not very hard. You just know about it once. There is something called a birth plan and during the birth plan, you know what you need to ask, how you need to go about your pregnancy and birth. So this labor and birth carries, a, this is the biggest factor where deciding factor that how you take your labor in a relaxed state during labor, you need to be relaxed, you need to do the breathing exercises. You need to induce labor naturally. There are so many ways to induce labor naturally because for some mothers, there is a, no sign of labor even by the time they are, uh, due, but the due date is not conclusive. It can vary from one to two weeks before and one to two weeks after. Up to 42 weeks is normal for a mother to birth her baby. So these are the things where I also in my uh, sessions, I help mothers in knowing about these factors and helping them go through the pregnancy, labor and birth process smoothly. Postpartum. Postpartum is a period where the mother is vulnerable the mother itself has become a baby where she needs to take care of herself she needs to take rest especially the first 40 days which is very 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 important for her and her baby and the first 40 days itself she will need to manage her food intake her nutrition her rest so that she's recovering from birth and she is also having her newborn baby with her helping her and her baby bond through lots and lots of feeding, lots and lots of skin to skin contact. And that's, that's the one that is going to keep their bonding. The first 40 days, if that is missed for the bonding, it can be a very big struggle for the baby and for the mother to understand each other, understanding each other in the sense, I mean that understanding the feeding pattern and when the mother is able to understand the baby's feeding pattern, the sleep pattern, that is going to help you bond with your baby to understand when the baby needs you, to understand what the baby wants. So the baby has different signs. There are feeding cues, there are crying cues, there are way the baby moves when the baby is hungry or upset or just sleepy. It's not that whenever the baby cries, the baby is only hungry. The baby cries a lot for a lot of reasons. The baby has... The, babies had, the baby has just come out of the womb and uh, the baby is feeling insecure about uh, coming out of the womb. So 
there are babies who cry a lot during that time. It's not only during hunger. When the mother knows of how to take care of the baby during this postpartum period, this itself will help her reduce the postpartum depression. And it is very essential that within the first 40 days to the first three months, it is essential that the mother is supported enough before she reaches to a stage of depression where she feels that I cannot take care of the baby. I cannot take care of myself. I don't know what to do. I just put on the formula and I just let the baby sleep and or I just let the baby cry or I just give the baby to someone else and I don't know what to do. But that's the stage and it can become worse. It can become clinically worse where she just leaves the baby off and the baby is, there's no bonding at all between the mom and the baby. The first 40 days is very essential for the mom and the baby to be having that strong bond so that the closeness and the feeding and understanding the baby behavior and adjusting the feeding pattern helps the mom and the baby bond very well in the upcoming months. Everything is not easy. It is a struggle, it is an effort, but this effort is worth making so that you are happy and you are happy that you have done something for the sake of Allah. And it's, and it's rewarding for you to take care of your baby in a manner that Allah has created the breast milk for the baby to take care of. So when we are able to struggle for something that a man has made, why don't we struggle for something what Allah has made? The milk that the milk that the mom feeds from herself, that is something so natural and has so many benefits for the long term, for the short term, for everything, for the baby and the mother. This struggle would eventually give you the rewarding feeling that you have bonded with the baby in the right manner. Now, making an informed decision, we'll come to making an informed decision is where an uninformed mother leads to an uninformed choice. It leads to trauma. It leads to postpartum depression. As I explained in my previous slides, we take decisions for buying a mobile. We just want a mobile. We research all the features. We try to look around in different shops where that mobile model is available or where it's cheap. Where is, is it having some offers? Why don't we do the same for the biggest, one of the biggest, biggest responsibilities in our lives, birthing our baby? It's not only us, it's our spouses together that we need to be sure in making the informed decision the right way with the right information to avoid the trauma and to avoid the postpartum depression that it can lead to. Dear mom, it is you who birth your child and it is you that Allah holds responsible for the therapy of your child and how you bring your baby in this world. This sentence itself is enough for us to realize on how and when we need to start planning for our birth, our baby, and the future of our children. I have already gone through this before. Al-Hakim narrated, I would just like to stress and emphasize upon it. Whomever Allah blesses with a righteous wife, he has helped him with half of his religion. So let him fear Allah with regard to the other half. Al-Hakim narrated in Al-Mustadrak from Anas in al marfu report. So what does this hadith teach us? Our spouse is half our religion. We are his half, the religion. And we need to fear in regards to him. We need to fear Allah in regards to him and he needs to fear Allah in regards to us. So what about our child? What about our child? When our spouse itself is half our religion and we are so responsible as wives to them and they are responsible to us, we both together need to be that example of good responsible beings to our child. So when we don't do our responsibility as a mother and taking the right informed choice for our baby, how are we fulfilling something that is given upon us as a responsibility by Allah? Let's talk about the story of Maryam alayhi salam, her birth and her pregnancy. Maryam alayhi salam is one of the best women mentioned in the Quran. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen her to be the mother of Prophet Isa alayhi salam. A whole chapter in the Quran is named Maryam. We all know about that, right? She was born in chaotic times when the Jewish people were eagerly waiting for the Masiha. She is from the family of Imran, which is also one of the blessed families mentioned in the Quran. Like her own birth story, her one was quite a special one too. When Imran's wife, Imran alayhi salam's wife found out that she was pregnant, she immediately prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She praised him and promised that she would dedicate her child to him. When she gave birth to a girl, she named her Maria, which means to abide. In other words, someone who incessantly worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals her prayer in the following verse. Remember when the wife of Imran said, my Lord, I have vowed to you whoever is in my womb to be devoted to your service. Please accept it from me. You are the all hearing, the all knowing. When she gave birth, she said, my Lord, I have given birth to a girl and Allah knew very well what she had given birth to. Male and female are not the same. And I have named her Maryam and placed her and her children in your safekeeping from the shaitan. The accursed. Quran Surah Quran 3 35 36 ayah. If you go through these lines, what do you see how Maryam alayhi salam's mother prayed to Allah when she was pregnant? How she was worried about her birthing her Maryam? See how the story unfolds in showing her tarbiya started even before she was born and that carried throughout her own pregnancy. This is what Imran's wife prayed for when dedicating Maryam, Maryam alayhi salam to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for she wished her child to be someone who served only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just right after Maryam alayhi salam's birth, her mother turned towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sought his good pleasure and asked him to protect Maryam alayhi salam as well as her children from shaitan's evil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted her sincere prayer and made her, Maryam, grow in health and beauty. Maryam alayhi salam's mother was a devout Muslima who was keen to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through raising her daughter as a true and sincere believer. She felt very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who blessed her with Maryam alayhi salam. Here the Arabic word muharririn is translated here as devoted to your service means preoccupied only with the hereafter and having no interest in the world in the service of Allah's house. Worshipping in great devotion, one whose worship is not tainted by worldly aims. So this is what Imran's wife prayed when dedicating Maryam alayhi salam to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when Maryam alayhi salam was pregnant, Allah advised Maryam alayhi salam to eat freshly ripened dates Today, such dates are considered to be wholesome food and medicine. Scientists tell us that dates contain more than 10 substances considered essential for the human body's well-being and continuing health. So when we have the information from the sources, from the Quran and the Hadith sources, and even from the sources of scholars, Ibn al-Qayyim has advice and information on infant solids how to start solids for infants, which most of us would not be knowing. And I myself came to know about one or two months before when I started solids with my own child. So when we have evidence from the Quran and Sunnah and how we need to deduce from where do we need to take the information from? If we are confused on that, always go back to the Quran and Sunnah. When we have information there, we take the information from there. And we also, we don't deny the scientific, scientific information. And whatever the information the scholars also have told us regarding this matter, Ibn al-Qayyim, how he has advised on infant feedings. So this information also is very vital for us to collaborate and integrate into our own practices with our babies. And it helps, it helps a lot. Because when I studied this infant microbiome, when I studied about how the gut of the infant is affected from, even from the time of birth, the microbiome is present in the baby from the time the baby is in the mother's womb. And the grandmother 
has the ex of her grandchild already. And that is what science says. And how the microbiome is related to it and connected to it is amazing. And it's shocking to know that the microbiome is actually influenced from way beyond the generation. So what diseases we have now, it could be a result of all the gut microbiome that our ancestors had and slowly how it changed through the different practices and how the junk food got introduced, how the environmental factor changed is so that our guts are so weak to handle any sort of load from kind of foods or germs and we have become so less immune to these substances. Coming back to story of Mayam alayhi salam. Mayam alayhi salam, I would like to just mention her, her story as how she was when she was young. Like the rest of her family was known among her people for her devotion to Allah as well as her religiosity, chastity and sincerity. Allah says in the Quran, and Maryam, the daughter of Imran, who guarded her chastity, we breathed our spirit into her. She confirmed, she confirmed the words of her Lord and his book and was one of the obedient. And she who guarded her chastity, who breathed into her some of our spirit and made her and her son a sign for all the worlds. One of the miracles she experienced was her meeting with Jibreel alayhi salam. Once when she left her family and society and went towards the east, she met Jibreel alayhi salam, who appeared to her in the form of a well-built man. Mentioned Maryam in the book how she withdrew from her people to an eastern place and concealed herself from them. Then when we sent her spirit to her and it took on for her the form of a handsome well-built man. Quran 19, 16 to 17 ayah. Not knowing who the man was, she sought refuge with Allah and told him that she held Allah in the atmosphere and respect. She said, I seek refuge from you with all with the all merciful. Leave me if you have fear and respect of Allah. Her words demonstrate her complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as the importance she placed upon chastity and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your Lord gives you good news of a word from him. His name is Isa, son of Maryam, of high esteem in this world and the hereafter, and the one of those brought near. Maryam alayhi salam replied, How can I have a boy when no man has touched me and I am not an unchaste woman? Jibreel alayhi salam said, it will be so. Allah creates whatever he wills. And when he decides on something, he just says to it, be, and it is. He said, it will be so. Your Lord says, that is easy for me. It is so that we can make him a sign for humanity and mercy from us. It is a matter already decreed. So she conceived him and withdrew with him to a distant place. It is very difficult for a woman to give birth, which can be potentially life-threatening experience all alone without medical equipment or a midwife's assistance in that time. So nevertheless, Maryam alayhi salam overcame all of these difficulties by placing her complete trust in her Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped her with revelations while she was struggling towards a date tree in the full throes of labor pains. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told her not to grieve he had placed a stream at her feet and told her that she should shake the date tree in order to get freshly ripe dates to eat. See here point I would like to actually stress upon is where we are not meant to birth our babies just without any effort. There is some effort even when Allah blessed Maryam alayhi salam with a baby. He still wanted Maryam alayhi salam to make an effort to shake the date tree in order that the freshly ripe dates fall so that she eats them. And now no, we know that the dates do help the women in the last trimester and even during labor to ease her labor pains and make the labor easy. He, subhanahu wa ta'ala, also told her to drink and to delight her eyes. As a result, she gave birth in the best possible circumstance. So here eating and drinking is also important. It is stressed that a woman in labor is not supposed to remain hungry. She is supposed to eat. If she's not eating or drinking during labor, then how is she supposed to have the energy to labor and reach the final stage of pushing. So it doesn't make sense when actually we are asked not to eat. And there are so many hospitals and doctors where I've heard that they give the enema to the mother during that time and she, she, she doesn't have. So what happens is when she doesn't have the energy to even push or bear her labor pain, it will end up in a possibly emergency cesarean section 
or having epidural where she's not able to bear the pains of labor. Coming back to the story again, the pains of labor drove her to the trunk of date palm. She exclaimed, oh, if only I had died before this time and was something discarded and forgotten. A voice called out to her from under her, do not grieve, your Lord has placed a small stream at your feet. Shake the trunk of the palm towards you and fresh ripe dates will drop down. Eat and drink and delight your eyes. If you should see anyone at all, just say, I have made a woe of existence to the all merciful. And today I will not speak to any human being. Allah's grace and protection was clearly visible in the situation. In fact, his advice to her has been confirmed by modern science. As stated earlier, Maryam salam withdrew from her society so that she could be in a psychologically peaceful environment and away from the hurtful behaviors of people who could not comprehend her miraculous situation. Muslims must not surrender to sadness. Rather, they have to trust in Allah and feel the peace of mind that comes with knowing that Allah will always help them. So this attitude, which is required of all the believers, has been confirmed by modern medicine. For doctors, they tell women, both during pregnancy and while they're giving birth, to maintain a positive attitude and avoid any worries and stress. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advised her to delight her eyes, which means not to surrender sadness, not to surrender to sadness and to appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's gift. So Maryam alayhi salam's story is full of inspiration from us, isn't it? We can learn a lot from her experience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us devote Muslims like her. Ameen. So from this story, I hope we all have understood the essence of how we need to birth our child. We need to make an effort. We need to know what is to be done when we are during labor and we need to have that informed choice. We need to know from the evidence sources what is to be done during labor, during pregnancy, birth and postpartum. We need to be in a psychologically well environment where we are not forced upon things, where we are not put under any psychological pressure or emotional pressure or going under any negative circumstance because it negatively affects our labor, pregnancy and birth. And even bonding of a baby, that is the biggest reason for increasing rates of postpartum depression. Let's come to Tarbiya Essentials. The basics of conception, pregnancy, and childbirth. How many of you have done your research on how to take care of yourself during pregnancy? How many of you have trusted your own instincts during the birth of your baby? I'm sure quite some of you must have had this, but most of us do not have this information. Have any of you gone through trauma during birth or post birth? I'm sure some of you have gone through, including me. I have gone through trauma myself post birth of my first child. So why has this happened? Have we ever thought on this? Why has it happened? In some cases, it is medically necessary to go through intervention and possible C-section. But the rates at which these are being applied on the mother are shocking. They have become a routine without any evidence of a complication or reports that the mother is brainwashed into procedures like induction, pain relief, and even C-section because some care, some care providers do not give the time and information to help the mother decide if it is really important for her to go through it or not. When you know the normalcy and instincts of childbirth, you will know when the intervention is required. You will be in a better position to consider the advice of your care provider and its effects on you and your baby. Do you know that any intervention or a medical procedure or a medicine reaches the baby in your womb within one minute of application? Even paracetamol is risky for your baby unless there is a complication. When and how do we know that we have a complication? This is why you attend childbirth education classes, speak to midwives, doulas, and breastfeeding experts to learn about your body and birth and breastfeeding. Knowing what to expect during this time of your motherhood is essential in bringing out a more confident you in order to mother your baby peacefully. The rates of postpartum depression are increasing because the mother is not informed about her developments. Learning about changes during pregnancy and breastfeeding will equip her with the right tools to help her prepare for a beautiful birth and beyond, inshallah. 
she would be able to manage her time with her newborn more effectively. She should take care of her nutrition and do simple exercises during pregnancy with the guidance of a proper care provider for the exercise. Her spouse, who is half her dean, should also be informed and educated on her pregnancy and post birth so that he can support her emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And it is very one of the vital support systems for her. If her husband is supportive during this time, she will be able to overcome any challenges that come during the phase of her pregnancy, labor, birth, postpartum. Dads are essential to play a part in being involved fathers and husbands. Now in Tarbiya Essentials, the points that I would be, and I have all, almost highlighted a few, is planning a healthy conception towards a healthy pregnancy. So just giving a brief on each point, I would like to mention planning a healthy conception is with having the right mindset, the right mind, body, and soul balance, eating the right kind of foods, having a stress-free environment, stress-free body, and spiritually more focused and more towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During this time, utilize this time to get more closer towards Allah. Importance of detoxifying your inner self, your surroundings, is by keeping healthy mind, body, and soul. So detoxify, detoxify physically, detoxify spiritually and emotionally. Let go of the bad feelings, let go of the bad dirt in your house, keep your house clean, nicely smelled, and let go of all the chemicals that you're using, even in the form of your Teflon utensils, it, it is very harmful for the baby and for yourself as well, because when you are harmed, whatever is inside you is going to be harmed. And whatever you are ingesting, it is going to be harmful for your baby as well. Learning about evidence-based options about birth and comfort measures and interventions. So when you learn about the evidence-based options about birth, like having a birth plan, how you need to go through in different trimesters of pregnancy, what are the comfort measures, how you can, you can relax yourself during these times, and learning about the intervention, the risks and benefits will help you in taking the informed decision properly. So why creating your birth preferences plan is important? It is important because you can clearly state your birth preferences and the information that you have learned and talk to your doctor in a more confident manner. And the doctor will also be supportive to you if she is truly thinking as a supportive care provider for you to help you with your baby in the right manner with a happy mindset and not basically put you into trauma. Making a birth plan, asking the right questions to doctor talking, knowing your midwife and hospital protocol. So making a birth plan is, I've already mentioned before, asking the right question to the doctor when you know about the evidence-based options. Knowing your midwife and hospital protocol is essential when you visit the hospital, you talk to the midwife, you learn about the midwife team, how is it separate from the doctor's team, and you also know what the hospital protocol is and how much common the cesarean rates are, the epistodomy rates are. When, when you have the evidence-based information with you, you will be able to find out all of this easily. And note down these points later, and you can have your discussion with the doctor again with this information in hand. Choosing the right care provider, even in the last minute, it's not a problem to shift hospitals or your doctors even while you're in the last week, probably the 38th or 39th week. If it is really required, because this birth is a life-changing event for you and your family. It is a life-changing event. Everything is going to change from day, from point one to point 10, day one, everything is going to change. So you're not going to leave that opportunity to get the supportive doctor to help you birth your baby in the best possible way. Pregnancy is an emotional journey. Seeking support from your spouse, family, and community is essential. When you have a supportive spouse, family or community around you, you are going to make the best possible choice for yourself and your baby, inshallah. Taking care during pregnancy, the first three trimesters is where I have always been talking in my previous slides. So it's very essential to know about the information during the first three trimesters of pregnancy. Knowing the risks and benefits of ultrasound, various tests that come during the process, 
pregnancy nutrition and exercise. So when you learn about these evidence-based options again here, you will know how to weigh those benefits and risks and talk to your doctor and also know when you have to go to the doctor. We should know when to go to the doctor. We just can't go to the doctor when we just have a sneeze, right? So we know, we know what is the length of time we can handle things on our own. And pregnancy is not a disease. Pregnancy is not a medical condition. Pregnancy is normal. Pregnancy is natural. So we know how far things are natural and when does the complication occur. So with that complication, when we have the right information is then when we go to the doctor for a consultation and ask her about our concerns. Next comes rectifying relationships and leaving off the emotional baggage. We need to rectify our relationships and leave off all the emotional baggage when we are during a pregnancy period because we have a lot of emotional ups and downs, our hormones are up and down. Any negative feeling in our minds or any small problem in our minds if we have a grudge towards someone, if you have some negative thoughts about someone, or maybe a, a difficult marital relationship, that will play on to your part during labor. Because during labor, there is a period called transition stage. That transition stage is where you will need that support system. And, and that time is so vulnerable during for your mind that first thing you will need to go through that to help you overcome the pains of labor. So when you have some negative thought at that time, it can stall your labor or it can make you feel not being able to bear the pain. So any kind of negative thoughts is going to hinder your labor process. And labor is a very crucial point of your pregnancy, right? So you need to forgive and keep your mind clear of all the negative thoughts and leave off the emotional baggage. Discuss with your spouse all the problems that you have and try to have a very strong and a happy bond with your spouse, especially with your spouse during your pregnancy and beyond. Knowing what to expect during pregnancy, birth and postpartum helps a great deal. You will be able to handle your pregnancy, birth and postpartum when you know what to expect. When you don't know what to expect is when you run into trauma. So you don't want to go through, you don't want to go through that. So when you know what to expect, the negatives and the positives, you will be well informed to ask a suitable health professional at that point of time. Postpartum depression and its reality is real. Postpartum depression is real. It can happen to anyone. It has happened to me. And it can be short, it can be long, it can be very, very long. So you need to be able to prevent it only by knowing the information and preparing yourself well, off, well before birth of your baby. Beautiful bonding with the baby after you give birth. And that is when the first 40 days to the first three months are the crucial time for beautiful bonding for yourself and your baby. And that golden time is not gonna come again when you are well informed of how to take care of your first three months. Because the first three months, you don't know what the baby is gonna do. The baby is newborn, the baby doesn't know what it has to do. So when you know how to deal with the baby's behavior, the feeding behavior, basically, that is the feeding behavior and the growth. So where you are informed of how well the baby is growing, whether your milk is sufficient or not, and one silver lining is what I'm telling you is the milk is usually sufficient for the baby unless there is, you have tried all the ways possible, but your baby is not thriving. The baby is not increasing her weight. The baby is not urinating properly. So that's where only you know that your baby is not thriving and the baby is not receiving the milk. But if your baby is having enough wet and dirty diapers, that is the key to show that you have a proper milk supply. It's only that you have to manage it the first three months because the, your body is learning to establish the milk for the baby and the baby is learning to establish the bonding with you. That's the only thing. And that's the biggest misconception which is going on in this world where the mother is made to feel that she has a low milk supply and she doesn't. It's very, very rare for a mother to have a low milk supply. And that is where I come in and my majority of my support lies with the mothers in the first three months of their postpartum. Seeking knowledge in Deen and Dunya. When you have tawakkul, when you have a good connection with Allah, when you have a good peaceful connection with yourself 
and your family, you are going to overcome through this smoothly, inshallah. You need to keep seeking knowledge. You need to keep the zikr on. You need to be in touch with the words of Allah. You need to seek knowledge. Without knowledge, we cannot survive in this world. We cannot live for the deen in this dunya without knowledge. Labor management and exercises is again learning about all the conform measures, comfort measures during labor and exercises during labor. Breathing through labor, the breathing exercises through labor is what you need to know. Knowing various interventions, the benefits and the risks of in each intervention and when you need it. What to do immediately after birth. The cot clamping, breastfeeding, rooming in, latch, position to feed is all what comes in before you birth your child. You know what order, what all is this. You must have come across all of these words, but you might have not known how they are being used and where they are being applied. So knowing about this is important. How to communicate your preference post-birth regarding childcare is again, after making a birth plan or in your birth plan, you can communicate about this preference to your care provider. Learning about the breastfeeding and its challenges. Yes, breastfeeding comes with challenges. Even formula feeding is with challenges, but the challenges for which Allah has made for the breast milk is a challenge worth making an effort for than a challenge you're making worth for a formula feeding which is man-made and it's not natural it is filled with loads of preservatives lots of sugars and has bad consequences for the gut for the baby long term and even for the mother because the mother is not breastfeeding her child the mother would have higher rates of breast cancer risk so all of this matters Difference between breastfeeding and formula feeding, knowing that difference, knowing the benefits and risks of breastfeeding and formula feeding. Once you go back home, what next? So this is very crucial. When you go home that day, what you're going to do with your baby? And that's where the breastfeeding counselors, the lactation consultants come in to help you to deal with that phase. Technique, shaving off the hair for the boy and girl with evidence-based option, when you need to do technique, how you need to do it. Shaving the hair for the boy and girl, what is the value that you need to give in for sadaqa? learning about nifas and its rulings, resting, nutritious foods, the care that, the, that you need and taking care from your peers, your neighbors and whoever possible if they wish to help and how you can smoothly take all the kind of help to in order that you can spend time with your baby and help you bond with the baby, especially in the first three months. And that's when after that when the baby starts, the fourth month, the fifth month is where the baby starts becoming more active. You learn they will become more expressive and communicating enough. And by the time you will also learn how to respond to their behavior. It becomes easy for you and the baby, inshallah. Focusing on building immunity. Your immunity, when it goes down during this time, it's gonna be very difficult for you to deal with yourself, your health and your baby's health as well. So you need to take care so that you are eating the right kind of foods and you're keeping your immunity high. And when you keep your immunity high, your baby's immunity is also gonna be good. Managing the visitors, many visitors do come in after postpartum the the time when you come home so you just need to be very vigilant and careful about what's just coming in because a newborn baby the infections can be a lot so you just need to be polite and uh, restrictive enough to let them know when exactly when exactly you need them to come in when you are okay to come in and not so it's all the management that happens the first initial weeks postpartum are very crucial for the bonding and very crucial for even managing your own health and your bonding with your family as a well. whole the baby is going to bond with your uh, spouse as well the baby's going to bond with her dad so all of this needs to be put into place before you actually go out in the open and try to interact with others understanding baby behavior having a baby log helps a lot with understanding all of the baby behavior because when you face a challenge you are knowing or you are having the presentation with you so that you can talk to the counselor or to the lactation consultant when you have an issue with the baby now the feeding Speaking to a counselor when challenges happen, supporting support for moms and the community, joining support groups helps a lot. And joining any community or joining mom groups when you are able to go out with your baby, you can join them and you will feel a lot more relaxed when you see other mothers also in a similar situation and how they are dealing with the challenges, how they share their things. So that's a supportive community. And that's where even my Ahlan motherhood is where I have a supportive mom community is where I have over 200 to 300 mothers in the group. And it has helped many moms, alhamdulillah. And by this, I end my uh, talk. And I hope all of you have benefited from it, inshallah. It's been quite, quite intensive. It's been quite 
short and long in between where I have introduced a lot of concepts. But this is where when you study everything, knowledge is not easy, but knowledge does make things easy when we start going through it, when we start learning things. So inshallah, I hope all of you have benefited from this. And if you have any questions, do put forward to me. And also, um, my um, I am offering a discount of 40% of whoever is enrolling with the code that you have got in the email from International Open University, where I would be very happy enough to support mothers uh, with a discount, inshallah. And uh, I, I would be also sharing in the link of my uh, support group and the website where you can get in touch with me directly, inshallah. Uh, I thank International Open University and Sheikh Bilal Phillips for having me here and Alhamdulillah reaching out to all of you in this manner where I can reach a wider community and help many mothers learn about themselves and how beautiful birth is. And also helping even the dads, if you are here, if uh, the dads are attending, helping them help 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 their spouses in having a very happy birth and a postpartum journey so that we don't have any traumatic births or post-traumatic experiences, inshallah, and reducing the rates of postpartum depression. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So if you have any questions, um, I, you can put forward, inshallah. There is one question in the chat box that I see it is a suggestion or a question. Uh, staying consistent with sister class advice, can we please get peer reviewed journals or papers that support the claims when referencing science and evidences on that note when possible? Can Sister Aparar elaborate on her comment about the grandmother carries the ex of her grandchild? Forgive my ignorance, but it doesn't seem consistent with what is biologically correct. Okay, I would be able to present the sciences and the evidence about this, inshallah, but I am not sure where you exactly want me to present it for. <coughs> Maybe you can get in touch through the emails or the, uh, it is a brother Muhammad Akhtar, right? So, inshallah, I will be able to present the evidence for that. Sure, inshallah. Any questions? Okay, uh, sister asks, can what overcome postpartum depression through counseling or a psychiatrist intervention is needed? First thing, uh, postpartum depression is something that can be prevented if we have the information. But if it is still occurring due to some clinical reasons or any, any trauma that has happened post birth, it can be uh, overcome through counseling and through a support network, basically a support system. So. As a breastfeeding counselor myself, I help mothers in knowing about their situation. If they, usually what happens is during postpartum depression is where the mother doesn't know what's happening. She doesn't know why the baby's crying. And that's the main reason. She doesn't know why the baby's awake. She doesn't know why she's up in the night. 
and she doesn't know why she cannot eat. So she doesn't know about so many things. So when I tell her that this is the reason why the baby is crying and this is, this is how you can manage and let me know once you have applied these two measures, just let me know a few hours later or one day later and come back to me. So she feels that sense of accountability and then she knows what to do. Just, you know, you're just telling her do one or two things at a time so that she sees if there's any change in the baby behavior. And once the baby starts relaxing and sleeping, slowly she comes out of it. But if it is a very big case where she is literally not taking the baby in hand and she's not at all willing to uh, feed the baby is where you need to actually visit her and have other measures of counseling. But in that counseling, her not only her, her husband or whoever a family support system is there needs to be involved so that they help her in dealing with this depression. And yes, counseling would help inshallah. And a psychiatric intervention would be, it means an intervention of medication again. So that would be, again, another thing that can be you know, associated with side effects. So as a counselor, I usually have a approach only holistically where it takes into historical assessment, her lifestyle factors, her relationships, everything is what I take into consideration and try to help her deal uh, and overcome it holistically without the need of any medication as such. Any more questions? Okay, inshallah. If we have any more questions, then please do uh, please do uh, get in touch with me. Here, unfortunately, I heard sometimes babies just refuse to breastfeed or they stop accepting the mother's milk. Why does this happen? Yes, it happens for a number of reasons. First thing we need to know which time of the breastfeeding they refuse the mother's breast at that time so when they are breastfeeding the initial middle or the end so that matters sometimes it's the over overactive letdown or it's the late delayed letdown so it matters if uh, if the mother is not eating well she's not sleeping well there is a delay in the letdown so the baby would be fussy in the beginning and then they would refuse if the baby is made to cry a lot just before breastfeeding then the baby would eventually not feel well so the baby should be fed on demand before the baby reaches the crying stage. And if the baby is allowed to cry and then the baby is uh, kept for feeding, the baby would not feed. That is one reason of refusing the mother's milk. The next thing would be an overactive letdown where the letdown is so fast that the baby is not able to take the milk and gulp it down at times. So that's another reason. So that is where the management again comes in, where I help the mothers manage uh, the way of feeding the timing and how they need to take care of their feeding times, uh, their eating times, and help themselves and the baby uh, establish a proper bond. Um, this is my website and alternatively my WhatsApp. It's 971. I just typed down. It's 971. So uh, they can reach me on WhatsApp as well. Uh, if you don't have any more questions coming in, then uh, I would like to end the session. What is your stance regarding exclusive breastfeeding baby friendly? I am an advocate for exclusive breastfeeding up until six months. And, and then up six to eight months, you can say. And uh, up to two years, it's highly recommended, I would say. Uh, the doctor's advising not to give water. It depends on what age the baby is. And the baby shouldn't be given water up until the age of, by the time they start solids. And it's not necessary that the baby starts solids at six months on spot. It can be seven months or seven months and a half. So it is actually the solids are to be started for the baby when the teeth start appearing. If no teeth have appeared, 
the baby can be given taste of food, but not as solids as completely filling our stomach because if the teeth are not there, the enzymes and the the, the way the baby won't know how to chew it properly. The, ba the baby's gut won't be able to digest it properly. And I have seen that through observation. I have seen that through experience, what how I have advised the mothers and how the baby's gut has reacted and they have got constipation because of that. So it all matters and, and it depends on baby to baby and how the baby's development has been uh, and how the mother's feeding has been, how the mother's diet has been. So the diet influences a lot of, for the baby's growth as well. Inshallah, uh, we can end the session. Thank you so much, sister. Inshallah, okay. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.